Jerry Nguyen, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Appreciate your time. Um, I'm for us all about inspiring people to achieve extraordinary things. So how and what during your life and career has inspired you? So I've always surrounded myself with a network of uh, people that can help. When I started Icebreaker, actually when I was at university I did a paper on why businesses fail. They run out of money, they don't have enough management experience and they don't have a clear, distinct idea. Okay. So when I was starting Icebreaker, I kind of thought, right, the idea is so good, it's going to work if I don't, as long as I don't screw it up. So how do you not screw it up? So I got people that could help, that inspired me, that could be mentors, mm. and I'll talk about them later if you want. Yeah. I raised some cash, yeah. and I invested in design and branding to make, to kind of shift Icebreaker just from being like a woolen jersey into you know a richer story that yeah. was more meaningful. And in terms of those mentors, who, who were some of your mentors? How did you go about getting business mentors? Okay, so I ran people I went to university with mm. and said, I've got this idea, who do you know that can help? And they'd say, well, my dad you know, used to run a bank or something like that, you should talk to him. So it was kind of like that, actually. It was just people who I knew. My dad's a doctor, so he hasn't got businessy friends. Um, so I asked... Uh, two people to come and help me. One was Peter Travis, who used to run the BNZ, okay. and another was a chap, Noel Todd, who was a director of Todd Corporation, which is a massive company. So I knew their sons and daughters, and they kind of wanted to give me a hand, and I realised that there's this amazing group of people who might be a bit older, I was 24, they were in their 50s, and they'd kind of been around the block and they wanted mm. to help, they had all this experience, yeah. and they could see that I was on a mission. So it's actually easy to attract people into your life who can be inspiring and really helpful yep. if they can kind of see a spark in you that, that you know they can relate to. Yeah, absolutely. And it was 1994 when you started icebreaking. That's 24 right. years old. So yeah. how did how'd you come up with the idea in the first place? So I worked for a research company and I was kind of frustrated, you know. I wanted to... I was always entrepreneurial when I was yeah. a kid. Um, we lived in the States and I'd bring stuff back and I'd sell it at a garage sale and I'd right. make a profit and I'd buy motorbikes in the winter and sell them in the summer and pay for my student loan and kind of always doing little things. Um, but then I thought, man, I would love to start travelling again and I was broke. And I met a farmer, actually I met a very cute American girl, a friend of mine went to Thailand and I said, send me something. And three American girls turned up. <laughs> um, and I fell in love with, with one of them who then did a tour of the South Island met an amazing farmer yeah. who had this merino wool t-shirt that he'd made and she said you need to have lunch with this guy and I said what a stupid idea she said just you know trust me so we this chap Brian Brackenridge so we had lunch and he threw me a t-shirt and when I put it on my life changed now, I was used to doing outdoor sports and polypropylene and polyester and all the synthetics. They'd stink, they felt plasticky, but it's just what everyone wore back then. And this felt like silk, it felt gorgeous. Mm. You could sweeten it, you could sleep in it, you could wear it under a shirt. And I just kind of fell in love with the fibre. Mm. So I got the sense of possibility, you know, I thought, New Zealand's famous for sheep, adventure, nature, Maybe we could bring it all together in a product which is born in New Zealand and they could sell it to mm. the Americans and go and visit the girl. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's literally an, opportun an opportunity that just sort of, I guess you found it and you just were so excited by it that you ran for it and put full energy into it. Yeah. When you're really clear, I find when I'm clear on the question, how can I build a company from New Zealand? How can I create something new? You know, if they're the questions mm. or something, then little things pop up, you know, yeah. see the world more like a jigsaw and you're looking for pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. So I kind of saw it and I pounced. It wasn't really a, something I thought through, mm. it was an instinct. Yeah, so you, you quit your research job, you mortgaged your house and, and launched Icebreaker. It must have been a pretty scary leap in those early days. Yeah, you know, I didn't have any money. I told the bank, I got kicked out of my flat before that, so <laughs> a friend of mine sold me a house cheap. Yeah. It went up in value. I went back to the bank told them I was putting in the kitchen, raised 25 grand, bought the concept from the farmer, yep. had debt, no money, no income, but I raised $200,000 from eight investors, these kind of friends of families, yep. um, 
mm. and I sold them shares and right. they kind of backed me and they helped me. Yeah, fantastic. Including my old boss who worked for the research company. Yeah. And the farm the farmer today, is he pretty proud of what you've what Yeah, you've really produced? proud. We've remained friends for years. He was a shareholder until I bought his shares a couple of years ago. So it's been a fantastic journey for both of us. Okay. And do you believe you could have had the success that you have had without your commerce degree and, and so on? Has that been a real instrumental part in you building Icebreaker? Well, I remember Peter Travis saying, great idea, show us your financials. And I said, what are they? And he said, you know, kind of rolled his eyes and kind of showed me how to do it. And I'd done a little bit of accounting at university, so I yeah. kind of pick it up quite fast. Yeah, yeah. And then he'd say, so where's your business plan? And I'd studied marketing and a bit about business planning. And really a business plan is actually working out what the future looks like. We're going to create a range of outdoor clothing, sell it to outdoor stores, from New Zealand Marina Wall and we're going to sell it around the world. Mm. And then you start with that kind of vision and you work back. So if you do that, what do you need to do? What are the first steps? So actually that planning side is something I got from my university background. Mm. So I would have found it really, really hard to know what the hell to do. Yeah. Probably I could have worked it out if I hadn't gone to university. I probably yeah, could have yeah. downloaded in fact, there was no internet back then, right? Yeah. You know, you probably weren't born, but you weren't. No, nah, one year. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you had to kind of work it out. So uh, for me, going to university was a huge help. Okay, so you recommend for um, young aspiring entrepreneurs and business people out there, university's a good place to get started? Yeah, totally. And my yeah. best friends now are actually not the people I went to school with, it's the people I went to university with. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, um, and you've said before that being a... A business owner, there's so many highs and lows throughout throughout the day, <laughs> throughout the month. Very, very true. Um, can you tell us how you manage that? Or? Well, I remember Peter Travis. He was kind of full of wisdom, and he had this deep, grumbly voice. And he, actually, Noel and Peter were directors for 18 years. They only retired last year, uh, just because they're both well into their 70s. And he'd say to me, uh, "You will have more highs and lows in a month than most people have in a year." And I go, "What are you talking about?" It's going to be smooth and it's just like collision mm. after collision after collision but actually having Noel and Peter toys we met once a month for 19, 18 years we'd spend half a day and, and we'd talk about kind of what happened in the last few months but really we'd talk about what was happening in the next two or three years mm. so when I screwed up when I stubbed my toe or whatever mm. uh, that's kind of helped me pick up and said it's okay it's just part of it Yep. As long as you're not repeating your mistakes. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. So that's the thrill when you're building your own business, when you're building anything. Yeah. You know, there's going to be roadblocks. Just, there's roadblocks yeah. everywhere, right? Yeah. And successful people go, that's part of the deal. Mm. I'll overcome this. It actually comes back to self belief. Yeah. Okay. And what about that work life balance? Has that been pretty hard to um, get right? Well, I had a young, oh, well, what happened? Okay. I was 24, got married when I was 30, and we, no, yeah, something like that, and started having babies. So for the first five or six years, um, I wasn't a very good boyfriend, I was kind of working uh, 70 to 100 hours a week. But then when the business began to get some momentum, uh, it was pretty slow, first year 110,000 sales, second year 330, 750 in the third year, four years to get to one million then 3 million, then 500, but then 5 million, we do. Still pretty quick though. Well, yeah, it's kind of step by step. Yeah, and yeah. This year we did 200 million, so I've obviously jumped a bit yeah. in the last few years. But that is all about, you know, your ability to learn, and it actually requires everything you've got. Your spirit, your soul, everything you've got. So I, you know, Icebreaker was my life mm. uh, initially. When the business began to get to a certain size, I could start hiring strong people. That's when my work-life balance yep. came. And now I'm in a fantastic place. I've got a business I love, I've got a beautiful family, I've got a great network of friends all around the world. Mm. And I have a very interesting and balanced life. Yep. But I had to earn it. <laughs> and you talk about work-love play. Can you yeah. explain that a bit more? Work, love, play. Okay, so I actually went to, there's a conference called TED that I go to every year. Okay. And there was a woman who was an assistant to three US presidents, and she came up with it. She said, here's the deal. And she gave an example of one of the presidents who got it wrong. Yep. He died miserable. 
and another one who got it right. And I thought, that's powerful work. So that's about having something passionate mm. that mm. you care about. You know, I don't run Icebreaker to make money. It makes lots of money, and that's great. Mm. Uh, so it should, right? If a business doesn't make money, it dies. I run Icebreaker because I love the challenge. I feel there's purpose to the work, and I work with amazing people. Love, you have to work with people you care about. I work with amazing people. They totally inspire me, but we're very, very focused on who we bring into the family. Yeah. You know, there are values that we look for. Mm. Um, I can talk about them later. And play, it's kind of linked. I have amazing time with my family and my friends. Yeah. I travel all around the world, and I work in the outdoor industry. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Very cool. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's, for me, I can't actually separate my life from my business life. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of a concept. That's and a good place to be those, though, Totally. Yeah. But if one of those is out of whack, and sometimes they are, yeah. uh, you know. Do a bit of readjusting. And yeah, constant readjustment. Cool. And in terms of the innovation, I mean, obviously, a very innovative company. Are you always innovating? And some of the stuff um, that comes to mind is like traceability systems. You can see exactly where your um, fabric that's been made, your, your icebreak has come from. But mm. Are you always looking for new ideas and new ways? Yeah, a lot of people off around here because I'm always thinking about what's next and why don't we do this and what about this you yeah. know? and you're going hey hey hold on we've already committed to this this and this so there's always this balancing act but actually in the last few years we've really systemised mm. every season because we're in a apparel company winter is different from yeah. summer you know this is a very lightweight fabric mm. perfect for um, spring and summer and then we've got a totally different collection for winter right so every season We've got a new innovation and new ideas. It's not like yep. a new colour or a new zip. Yep. It's like a new fabric or a new concept. Yep. We are planning that. To, now it is September 2014. I'm working on spring 2016. Really? Yeah. So whatever's okay. in the store, we sold six months ago and we started yep. designing 18 months before How that. do you predict those trends in terms of what people are going to be wearing at that stage? Uh, you kind of observe and then you make it up. Okay. So you observe data from your customers, yeah. what people are telling you, um, what they're buying, what they're not buying, yeah. you kind of learn, and then you just kind of make stuff up. Yeah. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do a really, really lightweight t-shirt that you could go running in? Yeah. You know, and you just kind of experiment, yeah, and you cool. give it to some yeah. runners, and they go, this is great, or this is crap, you know, and you're just kind of constantly yeah. getting feedback yeah. loops. It was interesting, actually, you said Catherine Wilson was saying right. some of the stuff in terms of the fashion industry is people literally do just make up the trends and then hopefully people take people take it up. It's pretty cool. Well, you hear about the trends that work, right? You don't yeah. hear about the trends that don't work. Yeah, and that's so like, true. Who cares if it doesn't work? Yeah, just yeah. get over it and move on. Yeah, and how do you keep the staff feeling personal ownership in their work? Okay, that's a great question. So, Noel said, you know, when I think about the difference in Noel and Peter, Noel, Noel was very, very focused on people and Peter was always focused on uh, the longer term vision and Noel always said we have to find a way Jeremy to make everyone feel a part of it mm. so I kind of keep that as a mantra and so what do you do you, you you get clear on the purpose of the company the purpose of Icebreaker is to inspire people to connect with nature mm. wearing a fibre from nature as opposed to wrapping yourself in plastic yeah all the synthetics and stuff that people used to wear. Yeah. So, like, if you're attracted to that idea, the relationship between people and their environment, and how that can kind of balance your spirit, because we all live in cities, right? The mm. design of cities is to compress time and space. It's exciting because it's creative, mm. and people like you and you know all the stuffs going on, but also it burns you out yeah. if you don't have nature as an antidote. Yeah. So it feels very purposeful to me to create a connection between people and their environment. The people that work here, we've got 430 staff, they share that passion. Mm. We hire people who are adventurous, who love what's new and love a challenge. Yeah. We hire people who are authentic. We hire people who are successful, we call mm. them achievers. And we hire people who are passionate. So when you get like-minded souls around building a business that is beautiful and sustainable and creating unique products, then everyone's a part of it because mm. you're bringing yourself to work, not just turning up, doing a job. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And we're yeah. small enough where everyone has an impact. Yeah, cool. Um, and Jeremy, you've been quite big in the environmental space as well. Obviously, the company is, as you say, making connections between 
the person in the environment. Um, having been involved in groups such as Pure Advantage and so on, what what do you believe business owners and business leaders and people all over the world can be doing to um, consider the, the environmental bottom line as well? Well, um, my life changed when we created Barcode, which is a way of tracing your icebreaker. Yeah. Because what I was trying to do was actually create a connection between our customers, millions of customers in 44 countries, mm. and the Merino Farmers in New Zealand. And I saw this kind of system, we call it born worn, that starts yep. with where the product is created, goes through all these processing loops, and all these choices to get the finished garment yep. to one of our customers. So when you see it as a system, then you go, okay, you're going to take responsibility for making conscious decisions about every choice, or you're just going to yep. see what happens. So running a sustainable business for me is about making conscious choices mm. and constantly trade off what's the right thing to do versus what's the optimal profit yep. position. Okay. So when you're consciously making trade-offs, that's how you can build a business of deep integrity. Yeah, awesome. And w- uh, within a decade, Icebreak has grown to become New Zealand, one of New Zealand's leading clothing brands and I think it's just outstanding. So what are you most proud of today? I love the fact that we're still committed to what we started yep. 20 years ago. And I love the fact that in 20 years we're going to be doing a better, better version of what we do. Yeah. You know, we're not going to do sunglasses and shoes and all that type of stuff. Yeah. We're just going to totally nail the merino outdoor space and lead it globally. Yeah. So if Icebreaker now being sold in 4,000 stores around the, in, around the world in 44 countries, um, what's next for Icebreak? As you say, do you want to keep going down the same, the same line or is there, is there some new stuff you're quite keen Well, we're on? pretty big for a New Zealand company. Absolutely. But compared yeah. to the big guys, you know, Nike, 23 billion, North Face, 2 billion, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's like, come on, we've got a long way to go, yeah, right? Yeah, lots of room to... Also, we're just starting to do our own retail stores, which are yeah. very exciting in addition yeah. to wholesale. And the online space is huge. Yeah. So... Globally, we're just kind of just getting started. Yeah, and what's it like having Rob Fife around here as your new CEO? Do you enjoy enjoy that? Absolutely love it. Yeah. So Rob was someone who joined to kind of almost as a mentor for me. Yeah. And he just fell in love with the business. He didn't want another corporate role. Mm. About a year ago, we said, "Do you want to swap jobs?" And he thought, <laughs> "Okay, cool." So I've been kind of working on it for quite a while. But I love. You see, the weakness for me. Every year, Icebreaker was the biggest company I've ever run, right? Yeah. I've been doing this, you know, making it up for 20 years. So now my role is two, chairman, looking after the overall business, and creative director, going back to what my passion is, creativity, design, branding, customers. Mm. And Rob is an amazing CEO, so it's actually a partnership. Yeah. And what's your dream still to come, Jeremy? Um, so I want to prove that you can build a truly global, world-scale, world-class business mm. from New Zealand. And I want to inspire other entrepreneurs and other New Zealand businesses. Yeah. I don't feel like, I feel like we don't have enough truly great businesses uh, in New Zealand. And I just love being part of kind of redefining what's possible yeah. from New Zealand. Great. Okay, so just moving to our quick fire questions. What does it take to be an entrepreneur? Courage. Courage. Okay, brilliant. And looking over your whole career, if there were sort of three bits of advice you'd pass on to any aspiring business person, entrepreneur, what would that be? Start with a dream. Yep. Get clear on that vision. Yep. Find people who can help. Yep. Um, and just know that <laughs> happens. <and> it's, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and from all your experiences in business, where do you see opportunities being today that people could be getting into specifically? Well, clearly the digital space is huge yep. and exciting, yep. and I'm sure through your program you'll be speaking to a lot of uh, digital entrepreneurs. Yeah. But also people buy products, you know. Yep. So I just say, um, don't be scared of making stuff. Yeah. As well as you know, living in a digital world. Exactly. Yeah. And is it the still still the passion that drives you today, Jeremy? Totally. Yeah. I, I love the thrill of building something. Yeah. Uh, I love the thrill of making things better. Yeah. I love discovering what's next, and I love working with people that care. Yeah. So I'm just, yeah, I can't really separate myself from yeah. the company. That's amazing, yeah. And what would the 16 year old boy you were think of the man you'd become today? 
probably be relieved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, so to finish, Jerry Moon, can you please let down our camera and tell us what are your wise words for the people of New Zealand? I just think that New Zealand is an amazing place right now, and we're lucky to be here. Great. Thank you so much. Jerry, cheers. Cool. Thanks. Thanks.